what type of guidance are you giving your patients on, uh, on protein? Is there any difference between men and women? And are you differentiating it based on age? Age, yes. Men and women, no. When we talk about protein, typically we talk about one thing, but it's 20 different amino acids, nine of which are essential. We actually eat for those nine essentials. There is a lot of nuance around protein in general and uh, what it does. Each of those amino acids do something different. For example, leucine, which is, I know, our favorite amino acid, is critical for muscle for muscle protein synthesis, but something like threonine is important for mucin production in the gut. When you are eating a lower protein diet, the organs, well, I suppose I should start with why are we eating protein? We need about 250 grams a day. We recycle much of that, we don't eat that. A portion of that, probably the largest portion, maybe 75% of that goes towards visceral tissue for turnover and maintenance. Maybe 25% of that goes to muscle. But we have to continue to get these essential amino acids so that we can maintain rebuilding and repairing, which the efficiency of that changes as we age. Anabolic resistance, protein efficiency decreases. Those are, or that is one reason why we need dietary protein, just to maintain the tissue integrity and the structure. Women and men do not need at this time, from what we know in the literature, a different amount of protein is not sex specific. It's body weight specific. The minimum amount of protein I would ever recommend would be 100 grams at a minimum. Men or women, that would be the starting place. Because if you are, say, a 115 pound woman and you are following the RDA at 0.8 grams per kg, what is that, 45 grams of protein or so? That's, that's not enough. Right. Part of the failure there is that we have to recognize protein is different amino acids. And so when we talk about muscle health, we need to get enough leucine to support muscle health. And that is probably the recommendation is two to three grams a day. It's probably for optimal health around eight or nine. And how do you get folks to think about that, right? Which is... Um... Because now all of a sudden you get into dramatic differences in terms of protein source. So if you, I don't really think we should go down the PDCAS pathway necessarily <laughs> for everybody today, but but just in terms of understanding that foods are created different, right? Yeah. So um, you can look at an ingredient label of something that says 30 grams of protein. You can look at another thing that says 30 grams of protein, but they don't list out the amino acids. They don't tell you that this one has more leucine or more methionine and this one doesn't. But there are certain themes that we know, right? We know that dairy-derived protein, beef-derived protein, and egg-derived protein seem to have the highest amount of the right amino acids, or let's just say the more important amino acids. So when you're, when, you're, when you're saying to that person, hey, I want you to eat a minimum of 100 grams per day, does it come with the caveat of assuming you're getting your protein sources here? And what you're pointing out is protein quality. The, there are plant sources of protein and there are animal sources of protein. And just from hard, fast biological numbers, we consider a high quality protein to be eggs and dairy, fish, chicken, any of the animal source proteins. The lower quality proteins would come from plants. When we educate our patients in the practice, we have them choose. And we really don't focus on plant proteins as a source of protein. While they do have amino acids and certainly a combination is wonderful, we like to focus on plant foods for fiber. And let's say we take out soy, but we really want to focus on high quality animal source foods because, listen, it makes up, let's say it makes up 30% of our diet, nearly 100% of our calcium, our bioavailable iron and zinc, selenium, come from these animal-based foods. And while we talk about protein, we should also talk about nutrient quality. Whether someone decides to get their protein from plants or animals, it isn't just about protein. It is also about those nutrients of concern. For women, like bioavailable iron. For kids, bioavailable iron. Nutrients that primarily come from animal sources, I, I just think are really important. And again, nothing wrong with plant-based proteins, but we eat plants for fiber and phytonutrients. And so we, presumably you have some patients, as, as I do, who are vegetarians, mm -hmm. and in some cases it's ethical, religious, whatever the Certainly. reason is. Um, 
what are some of the what are some of the things that you and, and let's go one step further and let's go because at least veg, most vegetarians will at least be able to consume the dairy portion but when you if you have someone who's vegan and who is purely looking at animal sources of protein how, how much of an uphill battle is that well, it's the challenge is the carbohydrate consumption. So I was listening to what Jeff was saying, and he was absolutely right. He could have, you were saying that you have maybe 100 grams of carbs and you have no problem with it mm. at a meal. Did you say that? Mm. I, well, I mean, you probably calculated it in your head, but yeah, that, but, that's, that's, <laughs> that, I can do that. And yeah. for someone like him who is super active, he is able to dispose of those carbohydrates. But a normal person, our carbohydrate threshold, if you calculate the disposal from skeletal muscle, organ systems, it is not much. It is about 40 grams in a two hour period. Anything above say 40 or 50 grams in a non-exercising adult will result in a robust insulin response. We do not want that. We do not want to be utilizing insulin to help support glucose. We want to use activity or have the health of our skeletal muscle be able to balance that. And um, I suppose what we're talking about is carbohydrates. And unless you are highly active like you are, then we also have to think about the carb portion of this and designing a diet. Typically for us, we think a lot about a one-to-one -one ratio of protein to carbs at a meal, depending. Let me think about that in myself. Um, that's pretty tough. You have to be pretty deliberate about withholding carbohydrates to, and, and I eat, I mean, I'm probably eating a gram of protein per pound of body weight. So it's not like I'm skimping on protein. Um, yeah, maybe I, maybe I, I don't know. I would, I would. But you're metabolically on... healthy. And that goes back to this hierarchy of how we determine Yeah, I think, I think you have a longer leash yeah. if you're active. Absolutely. When we make protein decisions in the practice, when we're designing a diet, it's age, it's activity and it's metabolic health. If you are metabolically healthy, then you can tolerate, there's no problem, right? Carbs aren't the enemy. But once we find out someone is metabolically unhealthy, which you can see from blood work, then you have to begin, you know, you don't change your protein amount because as you restrict calories, you keep protein the same or higher because you must protect lean tissue. And also it's, it's better. I mean, we've seen this in the data for a long period of time. What about overweight patients? So if you, let's say you had a patient who's uh, let's say it's a man, 250 pounds. And um, I know we're going to talk about body fat because I'm actually super interested in what you what you have to say about that. But let's just assume you did a DEXA on this guy. You don't need to do a DEXA, by the way. You can look at his, you can look at him. <laughs> you know, you know, this guy's carrying way too much fat, but the DEXA just gives you some numbers. The guy's 40% body fat. Okay. Um, so when you're trying to tell him how much protein to eat, are you doing it based on an ideal body weight or are you doing it based on his 250 pounds that he's carrying around? His target body weight. Okay. So you're going to say, I'm targeting for you 16% body fat. Let's calculate how much lean tissue you have at, what would you, what would be your ideal body weight at 16% body fat? And that's what we're going to target you at. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future. Uh -huh.